Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining Wisdom Tree's office hours on Fed Watch Over and Out, where you will hear from Professor Jeremy Siegel, Wisdom Tree Senior Economist, Jeremy Schwartz, Global Chief Investment Officer, and Kevin Flanagan, Head of Fixed Income Strategy. We'd like to make this office hours interactive, so if you have any questions to submit live, you can type them in the Q&A section of Zoom, and we will address them throughout the discussion. And please keep in mind that this office hours is being recorded. So with that, I'll turn it over to Jeremy to get us started. Well, we often get some fireworks from the Fed and then the professor critiquing the Fed and say, you shouldn't be doing that. We're very different. Uh, I'm not sure the professor's going to have that kind of comment today, um, but it's always great to get his reaction. We've got a bunch of questions coming in. We'll take your live questions. Uh, anything that you hear from the Fed and from the professor, uh, we'd love to engage on that. But professor, they're coming your way. Powell has been listening. Yeah. Yeah, uh, let me say, it kind of blew me away. I, uh, You know, this is what I've been advocating. I didn't expect the flexibility when the headline came up that, you know, three to four rate cuts. I said, whoa, uh, I think the voices are being heard that, you know, the inflation is basically over. Yes, there's stubborn core. There's the insurance, there's the medical stuff that goes takes years to go through. But basically, it's over. Um, commodity prices are sinking. Oil prices are sinking. Um, uh, the money supply is sinking, which of course concerns me uh, going on. There's just nothing inflationary um, that is going on. Even the wage increase of 4%. I mean, that's not inflationary when uh, productivity is rising at uh, two, three, four percent Um, so, uh, it uh, the rates are basically he said the rates hikes are over. Of course, if something terrible happened, you know something could could bring it there. I think the question is when. I think it's going to be sooner rather than later. I don't think it's going to be January. Um, uh, you know we we only have you know one more labor market report and one, one more inflation report. Uh, January thirty first, the next meeting. But I think by March we could definitely start, and um, I think we should. Of course, it depends on the evolution of the data. Uh, I mean, um, you, you know, uh, we have to remember, and I, I pointed this out, less than three months ago, the a majority of FOMC members thought we were going to raise rates in December. A majority. This was less than three months ago. So here we are, and we're talking about what they think is going to happen 12 months from now, at the end of 2024. Well, if they don't know what's going to happen three months from now, how in the heck are they going to know what's going to happen 12 months from now? The truth is, is that they, like we all do, have to read the data as it comes through. And that's, you know, there's, uh, but what I liked about today is the flexibility. I mean, he absolutely said we started talking about dropping rates um uh so there's two-sided flexibility um and the question is is how fast are they going to drop rates and it depends on of course how fast the debt. Okay, i'm gonna tell you if we get if we get some weak economic data in, in january if december christmas doesn't you know this christmas season doesn't pan out you know we could get a quarter point uh or so in in january uh, I uh, that that uh, that I don't see, but I'm saying it's not impossible. Get retail sales, of course, tomorrow. That's November. We, you know, we we have to uh, wait uh, all the way to January to find out Christmas. But um, it's I think it's great news. As soon as that came across, I said bye bye bye. I mean, immediately the Dow was up 200, closed up what 512 points. It's still a buy. We're going to all time highs, no question. Uh, certainly in the S and P. And the Dow Jones, we're going to all-time highs. NASDAQ will take a little more work. Uh, I don't know when and if. I mean, because what you see here, why why did the Russell 2K, you know, increase by, what is it, 3.47%? Now, we've had a couple other big moves on that, but usually it backtracked again. It's because with this flexibility, the probability of recession has gone down, and that's what been depressing the small and mid-cap stocks. And that's a, it's a simple story. It's nothing more complicated than that. The biggest threat was he was going to be stubborn on the downside, and he still might be too, 
it's not it's not completely erased but that was that was the fear now that he shows more flexibility that probability has gone down less probability of a recession so all those small mid caps that are basically recession priced are jumping if he continues to show this flexibility they should have a good 2024 Professor, one of the things that gave us uh, and you a, a early read, you know, we have been, we've been doing this alternative inflation, and I didn't actually hear a lot of shelter discussion today. Shelter was a big part of core CPI, and you know, you have this alternative way of looking at it using some of the Case Shiller data and the Zillow data for the the official numbers, and it shows much cooler numbers. We're we're talking like two two and two eight instead of the three one and four zero for core and and headline. But the, our shelter number has been ticking higher. Any any yes. incentives like we were like five to six percent well, different. Yeah, there, there has and, and and the question is, you know, we use a mix of case shiller and the uh, rental. Um, uh, the case shiller may be distorted on the upside because of the type of transactions uh, that are taking place in the housing market. They're at the high end. They're all cash and they're still moving up. Um, and then they apply that to a broader group of 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 uh, of, of, of housing. Um, uh, it it there there's there's a case to be made to put greater emphasis on the rental than on the home ownership. Even though two thirds are home owned, um, uh, there there is there's more of a case because you can actually think of the fact that really owner occupied chorus are the cost of the home times what the real rate is on, on the home. That's really the housing service cost that's provided. Real rates today, wow. I mean, we, we got that, uh, the 10-year tips, my 183, Jeremy. Remember, that was 250. Um, so you're getting if, if, an alternative measure, which we could think about, um, you know, is using a real rate on a home price. Um, uh, that's an alternative way of looking at it, and that's going down rather than up. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, the the, the uh, I I heard today, and I didn't actually check on the Zillow, but it was said that we had the biggest drop in three years in the Zillow index. Um, I don't know if you you caught that headline or not. But the rental part of it uh, and, and the imputed rental part is is going down. So we used a, a quick a quick measure of, of a case shower and a rental. There's a case to be used maybe to overemphasize rentals now and to apply some sort of real rate on case shower. And that would show a continued drop in the in the shelter prices over the last eight weeks. Um, so, yeah, home prices have remained remarkably firm. Uh, and it, it it has to do basically with the fact that um, there hasn't been supply. Um, and I mean, home home building and housing starts are very low, and people are are demanding higher homes, uh, higher uh, larger homes and bigger homes because of the work from home. I mean, not a, you know some people are going back to work, but other people are adding offices to their homes and they want another home and they want a bigger home. So. Uh, that's keeping, I think, that housing price segment high, but um, you could argue that the cost on that segment might not be as high as the outright case show or numbers. Professor, I wanted to ask you that, you know, at the November meeting, the Fed inserted, it had had credit, tighter credit conditions, then they put in financial conditions, and they're still there. And, and there's been a couple of questions kind of around that that we've had coming in. So now you have a 10-year a treasury that's dropped 100 basis points since prior to the November Fed meeting. You have a two-year now uh, two-year note, now 100 basis points lower than the top end of the current Fed funds target. And corporate bond spreads here in the U.S., investment grade high yield have narrowed as well. Do you think, I mean, I, I remember seeing some of the, the comments from Fed officials, not necessarily Powell, saying when it was the reverse, the tighter conditions, it was like, well, the market's kind of doing our work for us. Do you think it works the other way around in Fed thinking? Slightly. I mean, you know, they're, they're, more than the Fed, private economists use the interest rate as really number one 
but then they use stock market, the dollar spreads and all the rest as a far away number two, three, four, five. How do you want to weight that? I think, you know, some people weight everything outside interest rates uh, as, uh, you know, um, you know, maybe 30 percent and the interest rate part is 70. I think for the Fed, it's the interest rate is really a bigger part of it. Um, and um, uh, although they look at everything, but, you know, what what happens is they see a slowdown. I mean, you know, you know, when oil and commodities uh, and copper, I mean, when commodities start falling and oil starts falling, um, you know, it's it's not just the fact we've had bigger supply. It's a projection of demand. And yes, we had a good employment report uh, for the month of November, but one, it was very narrow. <laughs> there was just about two or three categories in which it was actually stronger. And I'm not saying we're going to recession or anything like that. I'm just saying that around the world, uh, you know, growth is really slowing. And uh, that's why you're seeing this drop in the longer term rates and the two year rate and the, and the 30 year rate. Now you're dropping the spreads because if Powell's going to lower rates, wow, that does reduce the chance of bankruptcy and the chance of that recession. So I would say that, um, you know, I mean, it all fits together and the, you know, and the stock market loves lower rates because that capitalizes earnings um, going forward. But I don't think the fact that we saw, you know, ebullient capital markets today is really going to cause the Fed to change course. Um, they're just going to look at what the real economic indicators are on January 31st um, to make their decision. I, I One thing I did surprise uh, that he did say today he did say that uh, they, they have an opportunity to change their uh, forecast. I always thought that they had to get their SEP forecasts in by a week to 10 days before the meeting. But he said they give them a chance to actually revise their forecast up until this morning. Wow. Um, and uh, he actually opined that some of the governors did so probably as a result of the very good news on the PPI. I mean, it it, it, it was much better news on the PPI than the slightly tight, the, the slightly higher than expected news on the uh, CPI that we got yesterday. So some of them might have actually lowered uh, their rates even more. But um, yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, financial conditions are part of it, but interest rates are most of it. So, I mean, just to follow up on that, that's a, that's a great point. So I know you've talked about it. We've written about it, watching jobless claims. Say jobless claims kind of stay where they are, and three month moving average for payroll stays in that 150 to 200 range, but you continue to see progress on the inflation front. Do you think Powell and company would be proactive and cut rates before it showed up, say, in the jobs or the labor market data, if it was just a function of inflation? moving more towards their 2% threshold? Does it have well, to be was, both parts of the mandate for the well, Fed to as, go? As, 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 as uh, one of the, I don't know, is it Glauber from the AP asked or one of the other, you know, if you if you think of inflation falling and you keep the rate the same, you're really tightening. And in fact, one person pointed out, you think you say you're tight now, you're just going to drop the rate by the same as the number of basis points you think inflation is going to go down. Then you maintain the real rate at the same level. And you're not loosening, right? Um, so there's a question. If you really want to start loosening, you've got to move the rate down more than inflation is going down. Um, that's why I think there could be well more than, you know, uh, you know, 60, 70 basis points worth of cuts that actually come in. Because if they really see inflation under control, um, uh, you know, then they got them lower to their neutral rate. Now, I think that they, they have the neutral rate of two and a half on Fed funds. I think it's higher, um, but it, it could be three and a half, and that's a hundred and that's 180 basis points under where it is today. Um, uh, I think I think really probably neutral Fed funds is three to three and a half right now, although they have it penciled in at two and a half when you take a look at their long term projections. Um, but we, you know, we'll we'll see again. 
Um, uh, yeah, they're they're pleased with how things have turned out. That everyone is. No one's forecast, including the Fed. Um, I mean, uh, I I I was very worried last year and early this year. Then they stopped. Money supply started increasing. Now it started decreasing again. You know, again, concern. Now I see if they're going to lower rates, we can get loan demand up, loan, and and we can get that money supply growing again, um, which I think you know will will bring about good growth. I think that you know the basics for productivity growth rebound are still in place for 2024. Um, AI and a rebound from. Uh, 20, you know, we still haven't completely rebounded from the terrible performance of productivity uh, in 2022. Um, as work at home, as, as people realize with the job market not as tight as it was that they have to produce to keep their job. And, and that's, that's a major consideration. Because if you think you can't be fired, you're not going to work as hard as if you think you can be fired. And, um, uh, you know, I think that slowly it's changed. And the word out there, I talk to people, they say, yeah, uh, you know, the labor market is not the way it was. Uh, even though job openings are still high, they've come way down. And in some key areas in tech and even biotech, it's just not what it was. Professor, that for people who don't follow that neutral rate and your comments closely, I, I know that when you say that three and a half percent is what you think is a neutral rate, that's a big statement for you versus 12 months ago or 18 months ago. Yeah. And some of that is tied to even a day like today, there's a rising correlation between stocks and bonds and and less the hedge asset. But maybe to, sort of talk through your how you've evolved on that neutral rate and right. then what that means for the 10 year. So 350 is neutral is for where we are in the 10 year exactly you've already priced in all the yeah i actually said i thought it would go down to four now it's at four already right. um so uh, basically uh as those people followed you know either our, our zooms or our podcasts i pivoted i pivoted in july um i gave it some i mean i you know i looked at the economy really closely i was saying a lot more strength than i did and when i said i said wow the neutral rate has gone up. Um, it's not zero to a half a percent. That neutral rate is, or neutral real rate, if you want to be more explicit, is that rate that would exist when supply and demand are in balance and when inflation, you know, is around 2%. So if the real rate is a half a percent, that means two and a half percent Fed funds. If you look at the long term that just came out today, you see two and a half percent. But I think because bonds and stocks uh, we've seen them being more correlated in inflationary times. And even though I expect deflation to rule over the next year or two, over the next 10 years, we are more likely to have more inflationary episodes. Not as bad as what we had after the pandemic, but inflation is going to be more persistent through many factors. Bonds are not as good a hedge. If they're not as good a hedge, they demand a higher return, a higher real rate, and a higher nominal rate. And that's why I've moved up my real rate from zero to a half a percent to about, you know, maybe one to one and a half percent. No one knows exactly. I mean, Jay Powell said today, you know, the big question of what it is, they keep, they're keeping it at one half. Um, interestingly enough, and I was always way below them as it was coming down over the last 20 years. Uh, now I'm, I'm, I'm hooking up to say I think that there that I think that real rate is probably closer to, to one and a half, two percent inflation gives you a three and a half Fed funds. Um that region. But they have not moved up their real rate right now. And by the way, one 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 factor that moves up real rates is not just the worst correlation between bonds and stocks, but also faster economic growth. And I have voiced the fact that I think that AI could add 50 to 75 basis points to real growth over the next three to five years. Um, still very uncertain, but faster real growth, productivity boost, et cetera, is a factor raising real rates and raising neutral rates. You know, Professor, there's always that, that I guess, I don't know if it's a disconnect sometimes or not between Wall Street and Main Street. So here we are, the Christmas holiday season, and a lot of people getting together. And when you talk to people, they don't feel, at least this has been my anecdotal 
uh, type of experience. They don't feel inflation has come down like we're seeing in some of the official statistics. Can you kind of comment on that? I mean, what right. what are because consumers it, it, it feeling? Basically, okay, so it's basically the following. Um, first of all, most people don't understand the difference between the price level and its first derivative, which is inflation. <laughs> um, and the price level has not come down. In fact, actually, Powell kind of talked about that. Um, what people are unhappy about over the last three and four years is the fact that the price level has gone up more than wages over the time. Yes, Biden can uh, say over the last year, wages have gone up more than prices, but not over the last three and a half years, not over the, the uh, sensitive indices that we have actually calculated um, that include current housing rather than the real lagged housing that uh, that the uh, uh, is used by the Bureau of Labor Statistics. That's why they're unhappy, because for the average American worker, he or she has lost purchasing power. And for the average American worker that doesn't own their home, that loss in purchasing power has been substantial. And Jared, that's... I think we should have the professor run for president. That's a great answer. <laughs> if we could only, that would be a, a much better choice, I would say. I mean, um, yeah, I mean, I, yeah, yeah. I've I've done a lot of explaining, though. Yet even my wife said, "Oh, look at the dad is good, Jeremy. Why are people so unhappy?" Um, and I said, "You got to look back at a longer perspective here." Um, and you know, when they judge a presidency. And they judge the four years. Well, it's, I guess, three years, um, three plus. I mean, they, they look over the whole and over the, yes, things have been pretty good over the last year. But things were really not good at all over the first two years. And they have not proved enough for the average person. And the average person without a home has suffered one of the biggest drops in purchasing power in in probably over four decades. So, so Professor, there's been a lot of questions on the recession. You talked about the, the, the flexible mindsets, lowering the probability of recession, sort of hitting the soft landing and small caps rallying on that. Um, there's been some questions about value investing. Is that going to be broader participation in 2024 on that same view? But any comments on the probability of that recession and what it means for earnings, multiples, all that? Well, it, it, I mean, definitely look at look at the Fed had a year ago. I mean, even the Fed, even Powell admitted, you know, everybody, every private forecaster, myself and and and, uh, and the Fed and everyone predicted a much softer economy. No one predicted two and a half percent GDP growth. No one. No one predicted unemployment would be 3.7 at the end of this year. Nobody. No one was with any well, one or two standard deviations of, of that. I mean, I was one of the very few people that were positive on the stock market in December of 2022, if you remember. Yeah. Uh, well, you know, we actually, Bloomberg did a study, and they said for the first time in 50, 20 years, there was more, you know, the actual median stock market forecast of December 22 was negative. So, but on the real economy, no one expected. Now, why why do I start it out that way? Um, uh, the chances of a soft landing have definitely gone up. Are they one? No, of course not. Uh, Jeffrey Gunlaff, you may have seen him on CNBC. That he's now their major commentator after the Fed uh, meetings. He still thinks it's high. Um, I remain very neutral. I was saying 50-50, and I was moving towards now only 40-60. And now when I see this flexibility, I will maybe even it's only one-third soft landing, two-thirds. That doesn't mean we might not have a little softness in the first half, and you know, and GDP grazing zero or a half or one. But then roaring back in the second, it's very hard to say. But clearly, um, you know, I had written into my presentations over the last month, the biggest risk to stocks was the Fed being inflexible. Well, 
the Fed being inflexible now, that probability is not zero, but has gone down dramatically. So right now, you know, I mean, um, uh, you know, that flexibility is going to feed into the market. I mean, you you could you could just you could and you, you, it's everywhere with the yields down and this flexibility. Now they may be wrong, and things might happen. But at least until more data comes in, that is really uh, very negative. Uh, you know, all time highs, S and P all time highs, Dow Jones, uh, Nasdaq needs a little more work, I guess, being further away, but uh, from the all time high. Um, I'm going to do a few rapid fire questions and help people answer. One, Tom wrote in is the update for stocks for Logwin available. The sixth edition is available. It's on my bookshelf behind me. So, Tom, you can get the sixth edition. We might have some copies if you reach out to our, our team. Um, the one question on 60 40 portfolios. Um, now, one of the things we do at Wisdom Tree is we do manage model portfolios. If you're an advisor on this call, we have Siegel oriented model portfolios where we're getting some of these ideas. Uh, and on his views on on how to be positioned across equities and and have run some income oriented mandates on different platforms. So ch please check out if we have a Siegel model on your model portfolio. But we also uh, have launched a, a platform called Wisdom Tree Prime. So if you're an individual investor uh, on the call, you should check out Wisdom Tree Prime. It's a it's a great app. Uh, I use it personally uh, extensively for paying bills, um, paying my house, my car, my three largest credit cards, using funds that are available there. And we're, you know, have the whole treasury curve, different things. But also, uh, quite soon, uh, you'll have Siegel-oriented funds. Uh, Professor Siegel has been giving us guidance, not a, a you know, full-time wisdom tree employee, but as our senior economist, gives us guidance on how to manage these type of models. And very soon, th those funds will be available in Wisdom Tree Prime, and you should check that out as well. Right now, we're not in every state, so you got to go to our help page to see if our states are there. But we're in a, over 30 states, so there's a very good chance that we, you you are in a state that can use Wisdom Tree Prime, but soon, hopefully, all the states. So we want you to check out those as well. Um, Kevin, any final thoughts from you? No, I wanna, you know, I just wanted to get the professor's take because it has been asked a few times and you did talk about a 4% treasury 10 year. We're there. Uh, we were yeah. kind of joking offline that, okay, I'm going short here. So I'm a couple basis points in the money right now. Um, do, you, <laughs> do you think that the treasury market has already priced in the good news? I mean, and now you would really need to see the economy more shift to a harder landing for treasury yields to fall further from here? Um, I would say, you know, um, you know, with this big drop today, 15 to 20 basis point from the morning, I mean, this, the PPI, you know, you may gave it a few more, the 15 maybe on that. You know, I said four, you know, three and three quarters of four, no one really knows. Has it priced of everything but a high? I would say, by and large, probably yes. Maybe maybe there's another twenty five basis point. But again, maybe the damage and the gr higher growth hasn't has brought up the natural rate not as much as I thought. No one knows exactly where that is. You just look at the market and and tell. But uh, your question is a good one, Kevin. I mean, I, you know, it. I, I was telling, you know, I thought when everything settles down, we're going to be three and a half on the three to three and a half on the Fed funds, four in the long. We're on four in the long. We're way, we're way up from for the Fed funds. Um, uh, so we're going to have to see how that comes. But there's challenges on the long side, on the ten. I mean, there's there's the funding, there's the debt, there's the potential future inflation. Um, you know. There's a, the fact that the Fed may really give up well before two, you know, somewhere between, you know, two and a half and three more. I mean, there's a lot of things going on. In agreement. Yeah. Well, Professor, we always love getting your thoughts. I'm glad that the Fed saw it your way. They came your way. <laughs> listening. You didn't have to critique them today. You get to celebrate. No, it's, I think it's way. my be, be, most praiseworthy um uh commentary on powell 
since the pandemic. <laughs> That's great. We're happy that Pal is falling your way. Um, and everybody, thank you all for joining us. Again, check out those models, uh, both Wisdom Tree Prime and on your different platforms. You can check those out. Uh, Irene, thanks for helping us host this call. And uh, we'll see you all next yeah. time. Happy holidays, everybody.